You notice I brought a glass of water with me. It reminds me of a story of a young Catholic priest who was terrified of exactly this kind of experience. Never wanted to speak in public, and he was good uh, all the way through college and his graduate work and his seminary training. Whenever it was his turn to, to get up at the podium, he always managed to volunteer to run the projector or serve the drinks or whatever. He was really successful at this, and he got all the way to ordination without ever once doing it. And as luck would have it, he was assigned to a particularly large and affluent and well-educated parish. And one day, a month or so after he'd been assigned, the old Monsignor called him into his office and he said, Well, Patrick, this Sunday you're up. And the, his knees practically started knocking together and he said, Finally, he just confessed everything and said he just couldn't do it. He had been terrified all of his life. The old priest leaned back in his chair and thought for a minute and said, Well, son, he said, you've chosen the priesthood as your vocation, and it requires that you give homilies from time to time. You're going to have to get over that phobia. There's no time like the present. So this Sunday, you're still up. And so, again, scared to death, he asked him, he says, do you have any tips, anything to help me get through what's going to be a terrible ordeal? The old Monsignor leaned back and he said, well, son, he said, well, I do have one suggestion. He says, you know, it's okay to always have a a glass of water with you when you speak. And he says, I've found over the years that if I fill that water glass with a very, very dry martini, <laughs> he said, it just makes everything go so much better. <laughs> so the young man listened, and the Sabbath came and went. And Monday, he rushed back into the Monsignor's office. He said, well, sir, he said, how did that do? The old priest leaned in his chair, and he said, well... There are several things I think we need to go over. He said, first, he said, when I suggested a martini in the water glass, he says, it was my assumption that you would not put an olive in there with it. <laughs> he said, secondly, it was also my assumption, he said, that you would sip from it at various times during the sermon, not gulp it down all at once. And he said, third, he said, remember that David slew Goliath. He didn't beat the crap out of it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, as was said, if you ask any group of Americans about the historical roots of the United States, they will most likely mention Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania as the necessary places, along with the capital in Washington, where patriotic American families must travel if they are to experience and pass on to their children the national heritage. After all, who's not heard in school that Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death in Virginia? Or that Paul Revere rode through the night to warn the Massachusetts militia that the Redcoats were coming? Or that Benjamin Franklin, a printer in Philadelphia, is universally regarded as the first American? Who does not know that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, and Robert E. Lee all hail from Virginia? Who does not want to visit the Freedom Trail in the Old North Church in Boston or Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the place where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were signed and adopted? New York, on the other hand, is a destination not so much to study the past, but to experience the present. Whether the bright lights of Broadway, the racetrack at Saratoga, or river cruise up the Hudson. Quite simply, when Americans think of New York, they do not think of history. And when they think of history, they don't think of New York. Why should this be so? After all, this state has more museums, more curators, more historical societies, more exhibition halls, and more colleges and universities than any other state. It also has more than a dozen urban cultural parks, more than 300 historic districts, 
and more than a thousand architectural landmarks and monuments. What it has not had is cooperation and coordination, whether among institutions or regions, or between warring upstate and downstate constituencies. What it has not had is a conceptual framework that focuses on the entire state and demonstrates that the whole is more than the sum of its parts, and that the critical events, historic buildings, and important movements in New York have, have, have added significance when they are interpreted within a larger pattern. The simple truth is that New York is not on the historical map of most Americans or even of most New Yorkers. This museum, this institution, proposes to change this perception of New York among both residents and tourists by seizing upon the historic moment, the quadricentennial of Henry Hudson's 1609 voyage to the river, up the river that now bears his name, to demonstrate not just that history happened in New York. History, of course, happens in all places and all states and to all people. But that events in New York, more than in any other place, have dominated and defined the larger American experience. As was said in the introduction, no other place, not Massachusetts, not Virginia, and not Pennsylvania, even come close to the Empire State when all things are considered. This reimagination will highlight a dozen major topics in which the places and citizens of the Empire State have played not a dominant role, but the dominant role in shaping American history. It was not, not, after all, an accident that New York became, as George Washington had predicted, the Empire State, or that the tiny settlement in Lower Manhattan became the Empire City, the capital of capitalism and the capital of the world. The most compelling and powerful interpretation of New York's history, then, would emphasize the ways in which the Empire State has provided the major thrust for events and changes in the entire nation. This particular view tonight is confessedly incomplete, and in places very painfully so. Thus, it is suggestive rather than exhaustive. But it's larger case that New York State has not been successful in capturing the national imagination and in receiving its fair share of heritage tourism should be obvious to anyone with a passing familiarity with the topic. Similarly, the potential of the Empire State to make more public and more persuasive its critical contributions to the history and achievements of the American Republic should be self-evident. With imagination, sustained effort, determination, and hard facts, we can convince our fellow Americans that today's nation took place in yesterday's New York. Now, what we have done is to organize this into a series of topics What I'll just very quickly uh, give an overview of. The first settlement. The first permanent settlement in the area that would be later become the United States was established on the site of an ancient Native American village in St. Augustine, Florida, in 1565 by the Spanish. The first per permanent English settlement, as you see in front of you, was established in 1607 on a marshy peninsula in the James River in Virginia. And in 1620, the Pilgrims, under Miles Standish and William Bradford, arrived in Plymouth Harbor in Massachusetts and set up a little village. Most of us learned those dates in school. But how permanent were those places, in fact? St. Augustine consisted of little more than three padres and a donkey for almost three centuries. And, at the, and in 1900, it still had never attained a population of even 5,000. Jamestown fared even worse. It sank into the mud of the river and disappeared. Archaeologists have been looking for it for years. Um, Plymouth also vanished before it was rebuilt as a kind of historic theme park in the 20th century. How different all this 
is from the Hudson River Lake Champlain Corridor. In 1608, the French explorer Champlain established Quebec City on the St. Lawrence River. The site became a critical fortress on a major waterway. Meanwhile, Henry Hudson in 1609 entered New York Harbor and cautiously sailed north. This pathway from New York City to Quebec City became the river of empire or the course of empire. And as we shall see, it played a major role in American history. And the little settlement at its mouth, initially called New Amsterdam, not only did not disappear like Jamestown or Plymouth, but it went on to become the greatest city in the world. Most New Yorkers, let alone most Americans, do not know that when the Dutch established Fort Orange, just a few hundred yards from where we are, or Fort Amsterdam in 1624 and 25, there was as yet no such place as Boston or Philadelphia or Charleston or Savannah or Annapolis or Newport or New Haven. Neither, of course, did Williamsburg yet exist in Virginia. It did not begin until 1699, and within a century, it also had gone to rack and ruin. Only in the 1920s did the rector of the local Williamsburg Episcopal Church come to, where else, New York, to seek to persuade John D. Rockefeller to help restore the faded colonial capital. Second topic, Native Americans. When Americans think of Indians, they tend to think of the Wild West and of heroic figures like Geronimo or Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce in the 19th century. When the cowboys and the cavalry fought it out with primitive sav savages to make the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains safe for white farmers and civilization. Indeed, few images are so powerful in American history as that of General George Armstrong Custer at the Little Big Horn in Montana and his 7th Cavalry, cavalry surrounded and annihilated by the warriors of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. But it was in New York that the white man and the red men first came to blows. And it was in New York that the Indians learned too late how to fight successfully against well-armed invaders. The facts are, of course, complex. But New York had more Indians and more tribes than any other state. And the Iroquois League, a combination of upstate tribes, was able for two centuries to withstand European efforts to seize their ancestral living space. The Iroquois were among the first Indians to acquire firearms by trading furs and corn, and both the French and the British learned to respect the power of their warriors. More importantly, the various tribes in New York that made up the Iroquois League, the Mohawks, Cayugas, Oneidas, Onondagas, Senecas, and Tuscaroras, put together a federation that anticipated the formation of the United States. Essentially, they created a central government that was peaceful in intent, but could organize military forces quickly and efficiently to deal with outside threats. And this reminds me, the, um, the character on the left, Red Jacket, um, we have his sheaf outside the door. You might notice that this place is crawling with police. And that is because there are treasures all around. And we'll be talking. I'll try to mention many of them, but I will no doubt forget. And so take a few minutes after to look at these treasures. And that's why the troopers and guards are here, because these are priceless. And this is your opportunity. Um, third topic, immigration and diversity. America was built by immigrants. From Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts in the 17th century to LAX, or the Los Angeles airport in the 21st century, people born elsewhere have always found hope and haven in the United States. By the 1760s, more than 60% of Pennsylvanians were of German ancestry. A bit later, Moravians were moving into Georgia, Catholics into Maryland, Norwegians into Minnesota. By the end of the 19th century, 54% of the residents of Chicago were foreign-born. 
Meanwhile, Poles were flocking into Milwaukee, Slavs into Cleveland, the Irish into Boston, Italians into St. Louis. But it was in New York that immigration and diversity found their physical, intellectual, and emotional home. As early as the 1640s, when little New Amsterdam had fewer than 1,000 residents, 18 different languages were being spoken on its streets. And that was just the beginning. By the middle of the 19th century, New York City was synonymous with heterogeneity and diversity, the most important magnet on earth for persons seeking liberty and opportunity, and the funnel through which immigrants entered the United States. By 1846, almost half of Gotham's population was foreign-born. The total in Buffalo was 37%, and in Rochester, 30%. Thereafter, more immigrants poured into the Empire State than into any other jurisdiction, and more immigrants made it their permanent home. By 1900, Gotham was in a class by itself among world cities, with more Irish than Dublin, more Italians than Naples, more Germans than Hamburg, and more Jews than any place. As John Reed, some of you may remember the movie Reds with Warren Beatty and can't remember who played his wife, but he was such a sexy guy that she left her dentist husband in Oregon. Louise Bryan, I think was her name, to live in sin with him in Greenwich Village. Anyway, they made this movie, Reds, about the life of John Reed. He spoke in Madison Square Garden about the Patterson silk strike and then went to Russia with the, with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And that as a young man, I think, of tuberculosis. Um, in the, in the 1920s, but before he died, and by the way, John Reed's papers in part are right here uh, in the uh, State Library. Uh, anyway, before he died, he wrote, his, and he met, remembered, he said, New York was an enchanted city to me. I wandered about the streets from the soaring imperial towers of downtown, along the East River docks, smelling of spices and the clipper ships of the past, through the swarming east side alien towns within towns, where the smoky glare of miles of clamorous pushcarts made a splendor of shabby streets. I knew Chinatown and Little Italy, Sharkey's and McSorley's saloons, the Bowery lodging houses and the places where the tramps gathered in winter, the Haymarket, the German village, and the dives of the Tenderloin. The girls that walked the streets were friends of mine, and the drunken sailors off ships from the world's end. I knew how to get dope, where to go to hire a man to kill an enemy. Within a block of my house was the adventure of the world. Within a mile was every foreign country. John Reed was not blowing smoke, and those were not empty words. He was giving an accurate description of a city that was like no other on the planet. New York was the promised city, and if its streets were not paved with gold, it gave immigrants a chance, and the newcomers would soon enough repay their debt to their new land with interest. Not by accident that the Statue of Liberty go up in New York Harbor or Ellis Island become the portal to America. And in the 21st century, as we speak, Gotham has more foreign-born residents and greater ethnic diversity than any other city on Earth. Fourth tolerance, and human rights. The modern American conception of freedom derives from principles and ideas developed by John Milton and John Locke and John Stuart Mill and others in England starting in the 17th century. The pilgrims had not even landed on November 21, 1620, when they anchored off Cape Cod and agreed to the Mayflower Compact. Since that time, from Thomas Paine to Martin Luther King. Thousands of Americans from every state have fought and often died to make liberty a way of life rather than an empty word. But it was in New York that tolerance and human rights received their earliest expression, their strongest support, and their most severe tests. When the Dutch established Fort Orange and Fort Amsterdam in 1624, there was no American tradition of individual liberty, religious freedom, or tolerance. For example, even while the Massachusetts Bay Colony, that's Boston, in 1638, was banishing Anne Hutchinson, 
for heresy. She disagreed on what you would regard as a few minor tenets of Protestant theology, but big enough so that they said, get out. And Ann Hutchinson had to leave. That's why Hutchinson River Parkway is named for her because um, she, she wound up being killed in New York. It had nothing to do with her religious beliefs. She was in the wrong place. But New Amsterdam was welcoming diversity and not concerning itself with where, whether, or what an individual worshipped. Among the critical events which occurred in New York, the following have particular national significance. First, the first Jewish settlement in North America. In 1654, 23 Sephardic Jews from Brazil, the first persons of that religion to settle in what is now the United States, landed in New Amsterdam. Governor Peter Stuyvesant wanted to throw them out. But his superiors in the Dutch West India Company in Amsterdam reminded Governor Stuyvesant that, quote, the conscience of men ought to be free and unshackled. The oppressed and persecuted from every country have among us an asylum from distress, end of quote. Second, the Flushing Remonstrance. In 1657, the tradition in New York of religious freedom was expressed in a powerful way by the residents of a small village that is now within the borough of Queens called Flushing. And by the way, probably the most diverse place on the planet. Queens is probably Flushing in Queens. Anyway, noting that Governor Stuyvesant had issued a proclamation banning Quakers from New Netherland and threatening fines for anyone convicted of harboring a Quaker, the now famous Flushing Remonstrance of December 27, 1657, and outside the door being guarded by these individuals, and you can look at the document, not a copy, not a Xerox, not a facsimile, the real thing. They even watch how long the lights can be on it. So you have a chance to look at it as you leave. Anyway, this is what it said. The Flushing Ramons asserted that they would harbor whom they pleased, quote, desiring to do unto all men as we desire all men should do unto us. I don't think better words have been spoken, really, uh, in this country. Three, the trial of John Peter Zinger, the first test, test of freedom of the press and the colonies, came in New York in 1735, when the publisher of the New York Weekly Journal, which had printed harsh criticisms of Governor William Cosby of the province of New York, was prosecuted for seditious libel. His acquittal represented the assertion of popular power against the monarchy and the principle of freedom of the press. Fourth, the women's rights movement. In 1848, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton organized a convention in Seneca Falls, New York, that is generally regarded as the founding moment of the women's rights movement in the United States. Together, they founded the American Equal Rights Association. Later in the century, New York remained at the center of the women's suffrage movement as Susan B. Anthony of Rochester spearheaded the drive to secure passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And Millwood in Westchester County was the home of the famous suffragette pioneer Carrie Chapman Catt, who was one of the founders of the League of Women Voters. Fifth, the gay rights movement. A vibrant gay subculture has existed in the United States for centuries. In 1950, in Los Angeles, Harry Hay and Chuck Rowland met to form what became the Mattachine Society. And in San Francisco in 1955, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon founded the first national lesbian organization. But it was in New York where a large homosexual population had existed for centuries, that the modern gay rights movement was born. On Friday evening, June 27, 1969, the New York police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in Greenwich Village. Almost overnight, 
Thousands of angry young men took to the streets in three days of rioting, demanding that they too had civil rights and human rights, that they too had the right to assemble and to socialize, and that they too were full American citizens with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We could continue this list. The American Communist Party, for example, throughout its history was headquartered in Manhattan, and there are many other reforms of one sort or another that we might add to our list. Fifth, African Americans in civil rights. Persons from sub-Saharan Africa first came to the American colonies in 1619 in Virginia. And by the way, we're not saying that everything that happened in New York was wonderful, just that it was important, as we were about to see. Where their status was initially ambiguous and akin to indentured servitude. But Virginia sanctioned slavery by law in 1661 and Maryland in 1663. And by the end of the 17th century, white Americans had created an institution that would call, cause unimaginable suffering to millions of human beings and ultimately lead to civil war. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 exacerbated the situation further by creating an economy that was dependent upon enslaved field laborers. By 1860, the question of slavery had become so important and so divisive that the presidential election that year turned on the issue of human bondage and its expansion into the West. And Abraham Lincoln was considered such an incorrigible ideologue on the issue that South Carolina seceded from the Union for no other reason than the election of the rail splitter from Illinois. After the Confederate surrender in 1865, the freed slaves sank into a new kind of economic slavery. Only in the 20th century did conditions substantially improve. It was in Alabama that Rosa Parks, before you, refused in 1955 to give up her seat on a public bus to a white man. It was in North Carolina in 1960 that four black college students began a wave of sit-ins designed to end segregation at lunch counters. It was in Mississippi that Fannie Lou Hamer and others worked with a student nonviolent coordinating committee called SNCC to build a new and free democratic party in the state. But it was in New York that African Americans fought the battles and ultimately won the victories that would resonate throughout the land. During the colonial period, for example, the Empire State had more slaves than any other northern state, and Gotham itself had more slaves than any city other than Charleston. During the American Revolution, thousands of Amer African Americans sided with the British, who promised them liberty if the crown were successful. When the war went the other way, many black loyalists fled New York in fear that they would be returned to bondage after the revolution. It was a realistic concern because as many as 40% of Manhattan families owned slaves in the middle of the 18th century, a figure many times higher than comparable numbers for Boston and Philadelphia. Meanwhile, there was internal violence. In 1741, for example, the Great Slave Revolt tore New York City apart and ultimately led to the execution of four whites and dozens of blacks. The Empire State began to eliminate slavery in 1799, and by 1827, the institution was finally completely abolished. But the Empire City continued to be the financial linchpin of commerce and human beings. In 1861, thinking commerce to be more important than justice, Mayor Fernando Wood suggested, I'm not making this up, that New York City secede from the United States and become independent, thus maintaining the possibility of profitable business with the South. In 1863, unruly mobs, angered by a draft that exempt, a military draft that exempted the rich, you could pay $300 and buy your way out, marched through the streets, burning the colored orphan asylum, and lynching African Americans who happened to stumble across their path. Before the disturbance was quelled by Union troops, Fresh from the battlefield at Gettysburg, there were at least 105 confirmed deaths and almost certainly any dozens.
of others. So when I say history is important, I don't mean it's always pleasant. On the other side of the ledger, however, New York was a leader in the abolitionist movement. The most famous of escaped slaves was Frederick Douglass, who fled his Maryland masters in 1838 and ultimately made his way to Rochester, where he edited the North Star for 17 years and became the nation's most famous abolitionist spokesman. Similarly, Sojourner Truth of Ulster County traveled throughout the North preaching emancipation and human rights and women's rights. And let us not forget that John Brown, who led the ill-fated assault on Harper's Ferry in 1959 in hopes of starting a slave insurrection, lived near Lake Placid, and his body was buried there after his execution. I might say that in this regard, um, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and the only one in Abraham Lincoln's own hand is part of the collection of this institution. And there's a sword outside that's George Washington's sword that was reportedly given to him by Frederick the Great. In the 20th century, New York remained the center of black militancy. In 1905, W.E.B. Du Bois and other supporters gathered at Niagara Falls to draft a list of demands which would end segregation in the courts and public facilities and unions. The so-called Niagara Movement was one of the first gatherings after the Civil War to attract the attention of liberal whites. And when the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, began in 1909, it began in New York, in New York City. Harlem, in fact, was to have an important role in African-American history, not only to become the most famous black neighborhood in the world, but it created the environment that led to the Harlem Renaissance, a literary, artistic, and intellectual movement that fostered a new and more prideful black identity. The reference led to anti-lynching movements in the Congress, and eventually to the landmark Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision in 1954, which supposedly desegregated America's public schools. I might mention that Kenneth B. Clark, who was a regent uh, here of the State University, was one of the people who provided the psychological basis for that decision. Thurgood Marshall uh, was, of course, a New Yorker, and he was the lead attorney. And many other leaders of kind of the African-American history also had New York roots and connections. Marcus Garvey, who's about later the, black of, the Back to Africa, Adam Clayton Powell, senior and junior, and Abyssinian Baptist Church on 138th Street, Malcolm X and the Black Power Movement, David Dinkins, the first black mayor of the, of the city, and others, and we could go on. Sixth, battleground New York. During the 18th century, American colonists often objected to governance by royal officials appointed by a distant monarch, in particular after 1765. The citizens of towns and cities up and down the East Coast exploded with rage at parliamentary taxation. In 1770, in the famous Boston Massacre, royal troops fired on a civilian crowd that was jeering them. In 1773, the newly taxed tea arrived in Boston Harbor and led to the dumping of 340 chests into Boston Harbor, depicted here as the Boston Tea Party. In 1774, the First Continental Congress filled protest the Coercive Acts. And in 1778, as British commanders shifted their attention to the South, Savannah, Georgia, became a war zone followed in the next two years by Charleston, South Carolina, and Wilmington, North Carolina. But it was in New York that the fate of the nation was decided. And it was New York that both sides made the focus of their military strategy. For the British taking control of the city at the south of the Hudson, base of the Hudson River, and its huge harbor, 
would make it possible to move north along the Hudson River, dividing the northern and southern colonies, separating New England from Virginia and Pennsylvania, and ending all hope of a successful rebellion. Not surprisingly, New York became the scene of the war's two largest battles, Saratoga and Brooklyn. Despite the efforts of David McCullough in his recent book, 1776, the Battle of Brooklyn in August 1776, the single largest battle of the American Revolution, is unknown to the American people. No doubt because it was an enormous British victory. Indeed, except for unnecessary caution on the part of two brothers, General William Howe and Admiral Richard Howe, the American Revolution, Revolution might have and probably should have ended along the East River within two months of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Similarly, the British campaign along the Hudson-Champlain corridor ended in disaster at Saratoga, where General John Burgoyne surrendered to the Americans on October 17, 1777. Because France came over to the American side after and in many ways because of Saratoga. That battle is almost as important as Gettysburg in determining the future of the land we call home. But New York's military significance did not, not end with the British defeat at Saratoga. The Hudson River Valley remained contested terrain and General Washington expended enormous effort to control the river of empire. His long struggle almost ended in disaster when General Benedict Arnold, previously an American hero, became a traitor to the Patriot cause by conspiring to turn over West Point, the fortress along the Hudson River, to the British. Major Andre, the young British officer who was out of uniform and who was captured by three kind of illiterate farmers in what is now Tarrytown um, was executed and it actually is remembered it. Major Andre is remembered in Westminster Abbey in London. And just outside here, in another case protected by the guards, are the plans that Major Andre was carrying when he was caught by these three farmers uh, and executed. Um, and all the while, in Wallabout Bay in Brooklyn were the prison ships, another unknown American story. What we do, the, what the British did is when they, since they captured New York the whole war, and since they had the greatest navy in the world, they took these broken down transport ships, kind of chopped off the mass, and just sat them there rotting in a muddy part of the harbor. And they put the American prisoners under the deck, threw them food down every year, every day. Um, it's a long story that we can't go into here, but the only way you got fresh air was to bury the dead every day by rowing over to the nearby shore. We don't know exactly how many people died, but the estimates on the low end are a little over 4,000, on the high end more than 11,000, and we do know more people died on the prison ships than in all the rest of the American Revolution put together. When the Martyrs Monument in Fort Greene Park was dedicated almost a century ago, the President of the United States was there. Now, it's almost forlorn and forgotten, and virtually no one who's a tourist visits it. Seventh, the Civil War. The central event in the history of the United States began in South Carolina in April 1861 when Confederate guns fired on Fort Sumter. That war ended at Appomattox in Virginia on April 9, 1865. In between those dates, close order assaults against well-defended positions almost devoured the manhood of an entire generation. At Shiloh, on the boundary between Mississippi and Tennessee, at Antietam in Maryland, at Gettysburg in Pennsylvania, and a thousand other places. Americans died in numbers not seen even in World War II. But it was in New York that the North found the soldiers 
450,000 of them, the money and the supplies that tipped the scale to the Union side. And New York suffered more casualties and more deaths than any other state. I was stunned, this is an aside, a few months ago. I was driving, actually, to Georgia to speak at Clemson, but anyway, South Carolina, but I stopped in Petersburg, and there's a museum to the Civil War soldier. And outside the museum, there's a kind of a semicircle, and every, and they have the seal of every state and the number of soldiers and the battle deaths. I was stunned. Virginians weren't killed in the Civil War. Now, I've overstated to make a point, but hardly anybody from Virginia was killed. 15,000 versus 46,000 New Yorkers versus 40,000 North Carolinians. And there were more people who lived in Virginia than in North Carolina. Somehow we've been fed a bill of goods about Virginia in the Civil War. <laughs> Somehow they were on the, behind the trees when everybody else was uh, doing the charging. Um, anyway... Um, we could talk here about industrial production. I'll mention in a minute, New York outproduced the entire Confederacy, uh, war bonds, enlistments, the draft riots, the heroic role of particular units. Here we have the, the 69th uh, New York Regiment, uh, Irish, is the Battle of Gettysburg, among other places. Uh, we have right here uh, behind me uh, a Civil War sword presented to Major General Governor Kay Warren of Cold Spring, uh, who was one of the heroes of Gettysburg, and I think it was General Warren who saw that Little Round Top was not covered and who ordered uh, Joshua Chamberlain in the 20th Maine uh, to make that heroic stand on the second day of Gettysburg. Um, here we could need to list, we could list the guns and the factories and various things that New York contributed to the cause, or we could talk about World War I and II, just quickly to say World War II. Most, if you saw Saving Private Ryan, most of the soldiers and virtually all the equipment that went to the battlefields of Europe left from the docks in Brooklyn, the Bush Army Terminal, the Brooklyn docks, uh, and the convoys which used to form in the harbor, be dozens of ships, and they'd form up the Hudson River all the way to the George Washington Bridge, and then one day you'd wake up and they would all be gone because on the cover of darkness, it all with lights off, they'd slipped out into the Atlantic Ocean, and then a new convoy would start to form. Um, a story that hardly anybody in New York knows. Eighth, agriculture. Farming, obviously, was the most important thing in the United States from Jamestown until really the end of the 19th century. Agriculture is important in almost every conception of our national life. Um, there's just simply no way to exaggerate this. By the Civil War, there were already two million farms in the United States. We know that after the Civil War, millions of soldiers, um, lured by the promise of free land, uh, moved to places like Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa and Missouri and Minnesota and Oklahoma and Texas. By the end, by 1900, the United States was producing more agricultural goods than any nation in the history of the world. But it was in New York where the transformation of American farming first occurred on a vast scale. It was in New York that farmers first became heavy producers of livestock and animal products, as well as fruits and vegetables. Indeed, until almost the 20th century, New York was the leading agricultural state in the nation and the home of many of its most successful farmers. Even Brooklyn, hardly thought to be a rural paradise, was a major farming area until the Civil War. And here I should say the New York State Historical Association is a wonderful farmer's museum in Cooperstown which we hope would be part of this effort. Ninth, uh, science and industry. In the 17th century, only Boston developed anything like a scientific community. And just before and after the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin in Pennsylvania and Thomas Jefferson in Virginia made names for themselves for their curiosity about science and technology. Meanwhile, in Rhode Island in 1793, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, a machine for removing seeds from cotton balls. Thereafter, the United States rose to world, industry, world leadership in industry and technology. In Massachusetts in 1814, Francis Cabot Lowell built an improved power loom and the first integrated factory town in the world. In 
In Ohio, John D. Rockefeller and his associates, associates figured out a way to reduce the price of producing a gallon of kerosene from five cents in the 1870s to half a cent in the 1880s. In Pennsylvania, Andrew Carnegie was developing new ways to produce steel in unprecedented quantities. In Delaware, DuPont was becoming synonymous with chemistry. And in New Jersey, Thomas A. Edison created a factory for invention in Menlo Park. But it was in New York that the Industrial Revolution took hold. And it was in New York that entrepreneurial innovation transformed the way Americans lived and worked. As early as 1842, Joseph Dart was building the first wooden grain elevator in Buffalo. And soon after that, that city, with 20 concrete grain elevators, had become the nation's largest center of grain storage. During the Civil War, the state by itself produced more goods and services than the entire Confederacy. Meanwhile, after the consolidation of the five boroughs in 1898, Gotham became the most important manufacturing city in the world, remaining so until the 1950s. Other New York communities, such as Gloversville, gloves, became associated with a particular product. And Elmira, the Corning Glass Company, began in 1851 and became the nation's leading enterprise in that field. In Rochester, George Eastman formed Eastman Kodak in 1892, and he soon put together the world's largest industrial complex complex with more than 60,000 workers at its peak. In fact, I don't know that I've ever seen anything bigger than Kodak Park uh, in Rochester. As an and I saw National Cash Register in Dayton in the 1960s when it was... Anyway, um, in Niagara Falls, the astounding invention of universal electric power systems enable power to move cheaply and efficiently over networks of overhead wires. In Schenectady, where the Edison Machine Works arrived from New York City in 1886, the result was the gigantic General Electric Works along the Mohawk River, nine miles west of us today. There, as many as 26,000 men and women fabricated refrigerators, wires and cables, large and small motors, and electrical switches and controls. We might think as well of Xerox or Bausch & Lohm in Rochester, of Stickley Furniture, of Indicate Johnson Shoes, of RCA in Albany, and the Grumman, Fairchild, and Republic Aircraft Factories on Long Island. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the Bethlehem Lackawanna Iron and Steel Company became the world's largest steelmaking operation, employing 20,000 workers on a 1,300-acre site that you can still see part of along Route 5 in Lackawanna. Meanwhile, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, one of the nation's oldest and largest shipbuilding operations, was turning out warships around the clock, including the battleship Missouri, on which the Japanese surrender was signed in Tokyo Bay on September 2nd, 1945. At the peak of the war effort in 1943, more than 70,000 people were working in the yard. Meanwhile, Larry Bell, developed the Bell Aircraft in 1940 and built its biggest plant in Niagara Falls. Brewing, I don't know if we should brag about this, but this was a New York specialty. We think of the Genesee Brewing Company that still stands in Rochester that was started in 1878. Polyglot New York City was, of course, a center of the beer industry, not just because Klein Deutschland below 14th Street would have been the third largest city in the German Empire. Um, in that year, New York had 90 breweries in the five boroughs. That's 1900. And as late as 1960, this is an astonishing thing, New York City produced more beer than Milwaukee and St. Louis combined. Now, of course, it's zero. Um, perhaps New York's most famous industrial and technological colossus has been IBM, International Business Machines. It built its first factory in Binghamton and its second in Endicott. In the 1940s, it entered the Hudson Valley and began producing rifles for the Army. By the 1970s, it had the highest capitalization and stock value of any country in the world, company in the world. I should say that the New York State Museum here traces its origins to 1836, and some of the employees of the New York State Museum, in fact, were leaders uh, in their scientific fields. For example, the first director of this museum, a guy named James Hall, 
It was regard, is regarded as the founder of American paleontology. And the list could go on. Ten, the transportation revolution. The first railroads were built in Great Britain in the early 1820s. They didn't continue to build them because no less a per pers personage than the Duke of Wellington remarked in the 1840s it was not wise to build railroads because they would only encourage the common people to move about needlessly. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, so the Americans kind of took it over. Um, the first railroad in this country was the B&O, the Baltimore and Ohio, in 1830. The first canals were dug before 1800 around the falls of New England rivers flowing into the Atlantic Ocean. The first subway was in Boston in 1900. The first electric streetcar in 1887 in North Virginia. The first airplane flew at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina in 1903. The automobile has many claimants, but most people credit Carl Benz in Germany. Uh, with the first horseless carriage in 1885. In the United States, the most important early tinkerers with cars, people like Elwood Hayes and Charles Dure and Henry Ford, they were working in the Midwest before 1900. But it was in New York that the transportation revolution really took hold. It was in New York that the first practical steamboat, the first successful canal, the first omnibuses and horse cars, the largest and most important subways, the most extensive highway network, and the first controlled access roads. Controlled access means you don't have streets intersecting at every corner. Um, there are many claimants to this, one in Boston, the Memorial Parkway, but most are in New York, the Vanderbilt Motor Parkway, for example, in Long Island. Another would be the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. If you've been on it, you know that almost always the intersecting streets go under it, except at Fordham Road. You could also talk about, um, well, probably the, the uh, best claim is the Bronx River Parkway, which runs from Bruckner Boulevard to White Plains. It was built between 1906 and 1923. But here, the Erie Canal is the most important transportation improvement in American history before the interstate highway system in the 1950s. And it had a greater impact than almost any other thing. Meanwhile, during the Civil War, New York has more railroad mileage than the entire Confederacy. And after the war, it built the grandest railroad stations, Grand Central and Pennsylvania Station, the most extensive commuter rail system anywhere on earth. Um, by the turn of the century, New York had about as many railroad miles as any other state. Um, and the 19, New York Central Railroad was probably also, along with the Pennsylvania Railroad, the largest in the country. And we're not even talking about Robert Moses the greatest builder that this country has ever seen, who built power dams upstate and Jones Beach and parkways on Long Island and built essentially everything in New York City. Um, 11, world trade and globalization. In the 19th century, tobacco and rice gave the South valuable export commodities to Europe, to which residents added indigo, wheat, iron, fur, skins, and whale products. In New England, soon after the revolution, Boston led in the coastal trade, and local merchants initiated a vigorous commerce with China. Thereafter, New Orleans became the major exit port for cotton, while after 1850, Chicago became the dominant in trading in grain, lumber, and livestock. But it was in New York that globalization first took hold on a large scale, and it was New York that would become the world's first truly global city, a place where the overriding purpose of the original settlement was to trade over the oceans. The Dutch established an open port almost from the beginning, and by the middle decades of the 1800s, New York's harbor was already the busiest in the world. When packet ships began to operate on a regular, ske regular schedule, they did so from New York. When transatlantic ocean liners began to move immigrants to the New World by the hundreds of thousands, they did so bound for New York. And when transcontinental air service began, it started from New York. The transatlantic cable connected New York to London, to Europe, before any other place. In fact, there's a, well, I'm, but I, I've got to quit and have these asides. And after 1917, the first stock exchange, which was started under a buttonwood tree in 1792, but it was only in 1917, during the First World War, that the world's financial capital essentially moved 
from London to York, New York, where it's remained ever since. Um, I'd like to talk about containerization, but the slightly uncomfortable fact is it was, it was invented in New York Harbor, but by a guy from New Jersey, so I guess we have to let it go. Um, finally, the last one, at least we'll talk about in any detail, is the visual arts. The flowering of the visual arts in America traces its origins, of course, many places and people. Early in the 18th century, Charleston and Annapolis, Philadelphia and Boston provided the homes for more painters than any city in New York State. John Singleton Copley, who lived and worked in Boston, was probably the first native-born artist to win international recognition. As late as the early 1800s, the reputations of Charles Winston, Wilson Peel of Philadelphia Gilbert Stewart of Boston, Ralph Earl of Connecticut, surpassed those of any New Yorkers. And even during that century, other states produced artists of the first rank, including Winslow Homer of Boston and Thomas Aikens of Philadelphia. And I think this is Aikens. Uh, that's before you. But it was in New York that the visual arts were to find their enduring home, their most generous supporters, their broadest audiences, and their grandest museums. The examples here are so numerous that they defy brief lists, but at a minimum, they would include the Hudson River School from the 1820s, you could, some people say 1850s, 1880s, 1950s, but think of John Trumbull and Thomas Cole and Frederick Edwin Church, Asher Durand, or think of the Ashcan School, the Armory Show in 1913, people like Arthur Davies, Maurice Pendergast, Ernest Lawson, William Glackens, Everett Shin, John Sloan, George Bellows. Any listing would have to include more recent painters, such as Jackson Pollock, probably on Long Island here, or Grandma Moses, official name was Anna Mae Moses, as well as the Albany Institute here, the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and other repositories around the state. And I should mention, I think it's right here, we have Thomas Cole's sketchbook on exhibit. Um, Thomas Cole was the one, of course, who painted The Course of Empire, which is uh, one of America's greatest artistic treasures here in New York. These 12 topics are suggestive rather than exhaustive. You could probably think of another 12 and forget the 12 we've just mentioned. Other potential organizing themes might be religion. You think of the revival in the early 1800s in what's called the burned over district in Western New York. Or think of the birth of Mormonism in New York. There's a new biography of Joseph Smith by Richard Bushman just published. Or think of Archbishop John Hughes in the city who was the really inventor of parochial education in the United States. Or Norman Vincent Peale, or the existence of the largest cathedral in the world here in New York State. Or we could think of literature and organize it around that theme and think about Washington Irving, uh, Walt Whitman, and by the way, we have a I think a second edition of Leaves of Grass, right here in this case, to the right. Or James Fenimore Cooper and the leather stocking tales on, in Cooperstown, New York, and on that just most gorgeous of all lakes. Or Herman Melville. We have our first edition of Moby Dick, again, right behind me, that you want to take a look at. Or Stephen Crane, who wrote The Red Badge of Courage and who died, who was born in Newark, but I think he died in Manhattan at the age of, like, 29 or something really young. Edith Wharton, Mark Twain, uh, who died, of course, in uh, Elmira, I believe it is, and that's where he's buried. Uh, William Kennedy here in Albany. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Edith Wharton, O. Henry, Joseph Mitchell, who wrote Up in the, Up in the Old Hotel, which is a classic. Norman Mailer, Truman Capote, Thomas Wolfe, the list could go on. Or sports. And as I speak, there's an exhibition on sports, the 25 most important sports events in New York's history. Um, you know, from the greatest football game ever played, you know, with the Baltimore Colts and the New York Giants, to the, to the miracle of Lake Placid in, in 1980, to the, essentially the birth of soccer and birth of lacrosse 
to the greatest baseball catch ever made by Willie Mays, and no one will ever surpass it because of the peculiar shape of the polo grounds, which was a rectangle, and dead away center field was like 480 feet. So he could just run for all he was worth, knowing he wouldn't hit the fence and stick out his hand. Now if a person ran that far, they would kill themselves hitting the, the wall and the seats. Um, the breaking of the color line by Jackie Robinson, um, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, and dozens of other things. We could think of the Constitution. After all, Philadelphia sort of has stolen that from everyone else. But the Federalist Papers, which were about New York, essentially, and the trying to get this state to run, was, was, about, was done here in New York, uh, New York State. Um, the Iroquois example that we mentioned earlier, um, the uh, location of the first capital of the United States. I noticed the other day that Philadelphia on its website says it's the first capital of the United States. I wanted to respond and said, well, where do you think George Washington took the oath of office? Or where do you think the Bill of Rights was passed? You know, on, um, in an airplane? Um, 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 that's why we have to fight, because other states will claim it right out from under you. Um, Architecture and planning could be wonderful here. The Octagon House, those mansions up and down the Hudson River, um, the uh, Olana, uh, the Woolworth Empire State, Seagram, Colgate Buildings, Rockefeller Center, the Albany Mall, um, the robber barons and the uh, growth of high finance and high society. Almost every name you may think of is a robber barons associated with New York. Think of John Jacob Astor, the first rich American, uh, John D. Rockefeller, J. Gold, J.B. Morgan, Henry Clay Frick, Commodore Vanderbilt, F.W. Woolworth, Michael Bloomberg, Donald Trump, you know, it goes on. Um, and you know, here's a, here's a really good one that we really ought to think is kind of political reform. Because New York State and Albany and the state legislature have paid, played a major role in this. One thinks of of various kinds of welfare reform, of civil rights reform, of public housing. There was public housing in New York before there was United States public housing. Uh, temperance reform, children's aid society, settlement houses. First one, tenement reform, factory legislation from the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, labor unions. Uh, all that took place in New York. Again, there are many possible directions which we might follow. The overriding considerations, I think, should be, one, was the issue important in American history? And two, did New York State play a major role in its evolution and development? As we here in New York try to reclaim our role in American history, and as this institution tries to reconfigure its space and reimagine its presentation. I think these subjects might be the ones, or might be the hooks, mm -hmm. on which we hang the evidence, which will demonstrate the enormous and dominant and sometimes preeminent role that the state of New York has played in building the American nation. Thank you very much. Thank you.